Welcome. I'm Laura Mandel, Executive Director of the Jewish Arts Collaborative, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Studio Israel, a series that gives a peek into Israeli life and society through art. This conversation series is designed to give us a deep dive into some of the most important creative work coming out of Israel and to frame the work through this incredible Brandeis academic expertise. This series is a collaborative effort, so I'm actually proud to welcome you all on behalf of not only the Jewish Arts Collaborative, but of course the Rose Art Museum, the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, the Vilna Shul, Boston Center for Jewish Culture, and with a special thanks to CJP Arts and Culture for making this series possible. Today, we are in for a real treat with artist Zoya Cherkasky Nadi. I actually first came across Zoya's work around 2010, many years ago, when I discovered her Aachen Passover Haggadah work, which I cannot recommend checking out enough. I've watched all these years as her work has evolved, and today I'm really excited to hear her speak about her full story. Um, of course, we'll have questions, or a little bit of time for questions at the end, and our moderator, Ganit, will go ahead and, and ask some of those at the end. We are so lucky to have Zoya in conversation with Dr. Ganit and Corey. Um, who will now be introduced by Shana Weiss, Associate Director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank you all for being here today. On behalf of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies, all our partners that Laura mentioned, I am so excited um, for this conversation and for to welcome you all here today. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Professor, Dr. Um, and Curator Ganit Ankori, and then um, she will introduce Zoya. Um, so Ganit, in addition to being an incredible scholar, author, educator, and friend, she is the Henry and Lois Foster Director and Chief Curator of the Rose Art Museum and a Professor of Fine Arts in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies here at Brandeis University. She has done incredible work in modern and contemporary art. She uses a global perspective she thinks about all sorts of issues related to gender, identity, religion, trauma, exile, hybridity, disability, and how this manifests in the creative arts. She is especially known um, and renowned internationally for her scholarship on Frida Kahlo, who we see a little bit today, and her background in Israeli and Palestinian art. And just on a personal level, um, my friendship and relationship with Gani, which I know that many other people, including Zoya, are lucky to have, has really taught me about the importance of creativity um, and mentorship and collaboration, all feminist values I know that Gani takes seriously. Um, and that role in creativity, that we're not just solo beings, that is an important, we're all working together. And to that point, in the last decade, um, she has been engaged in an important dialogue and conversation with Ukrainian-born Israeli artist Zoya Cherkasi Nadi. Um, their conversation and friendship will inform the conversation we're going to have today. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ganit and Corey. Thank you. Wow. What a lovely introduction, Shana. And thank you and thank Laura. And hey, Zoya, so great to <laughs> talk to you again. 
I'm going to jump right into it because when I start talking with Zoya and looking at her art together, which today we'll share with all of you, um, there's never enough time. We always want more and more. So with your permission, I will share my PowerPoint with the images and we will start uh, diving directly into it. Um, so Zoya. Um, I think that because your work is informed by your biography, your life, um, we, we should start there. Um, and, uh, from there extrapolate on the themes of immigration, identity, religions, living between cultures, um, uh, and many other uh, things that appear in your artwork, but which are really informed by your life. I chose this very recent uh, photograph, which you call my, my family at the immigration office. And yes. I want you to just talk us through this. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. And uh, I'm really excited to do this talk and uh, thank you, Ganit, for inviting me. Um, uh, as you said, I was born in Ukraine and uh, I grew there like um, I always uh, knew that we, we are a Jewish family, but uh, being Jewish in Soviet Union is a bit different from being Jewish uh, anywhere else because it's not a matter of religion, it's a matter of uh, ethnicity. So um, when I was uh, 14, we moved, I've moved to, to Israel with my family and then uh, I found out that in Israel we are we are not Jews. We are not Jewish because uh, uh, my mother's mother is Ukrainian. So, so like it's changing everything. So, somehow I uh, I was like used to live my life as a minority, as Jewish in, in Ukraine and as Ukrainian in Israel. So I guess it has affected um, my art a lot, uh, especially because I usually depict what I see. Like all my paintings, they are based on my personal experience. And uh, here, uh, at this image, what we see is actually um, uh, I, my husband, he is uh, a Nigerian immigrant, working immigrant. He came to Israel 15 years ago uh, like to look for work. And uh, uh, I met him uh, when, uh, actually I invited him to model for me uh, and uh, we are married already for 13, for 13 years and uh, we have a daughter who is seven. And uh, at this picture, she's like much younger. And actually this is the moment when uh, my husband got his uh, Israeli citizenship. It took us like seven years to get it. And um, uh, my daughter was uh, two years old and this is like the happy moment, but this is just the moment before because like I, I, I I can, I guess you can see how I'm worried by my face, face expression because uh, it's like really tough process when they investigate you, like ask you questions, like they put you apart and ask you questions about like what color of uh, toothbrush your husband have or like uh, what color of uh, underwear he's wearing now. And uh, like even, even as a married couple, you're not always uh, remember such things. So like you really have to be prepared and uh, uh, there is a TV in the corner, and uh, like it, there is an, in Hebrew, there is a word losing identity. And actually, there was some advertisement talking about lo losing the ID card. But uh, but like uh, I, like I, I always try to find meaning, meaningful details. So this uh, losing identity frame, it was like perfect for the situation. Right. So uh, for those of you who have not had the, well, what's the opposite of pleasure? The displeasure of going uh, to the immigration office in Israel. Uh, here you take a number. Here uh, it says what you need to do to extend your visas and the hours. Of course, there's a lot of uh, national pride, but uh, it's always a stressful time. And here, this loss of identity when you come from Ukraine and uh, you come from Nigeria, you leave behind cultures, you find uh, a way of building your family in Israel with 
Vera and everything, it's, it's, um, it's complicated. It's complicated. So these events, both her own immigration, her childhood in, uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev, actually, her um, um, husband's family in Nigeria, all these uh, lived experiences find expression in the works that we'll see now. And Zoya and I organized this PowerPoint according to series. We want to go through most of them quickly so we have time huh. for a preview of the new work that will be uh, shown for the very first time next week in New York at Fort uh, Gansevoort uh, Gallery. Uh, so this is one of the main uh, works called New Victims uh, from, I don't know if you can see the catalog. Yeah. Pravda, a series of works by uh, Zoya that was shown in the Israel Museum. So why don't you start with the title of the exhibition and then move to this incredible painting? Yeah. Well, actually, this uh, exhibition, I made it in 2018. And um, it was, uh, I think, the, the first time that the story of uh, post-Soviet immigration of the 90s uh, to Israel was uh, told so massively. Uh, I was actually working on this project for nine years. And uh, it's like a satiric project about, uh, about like the life of uh, post-Soviet immigrants in Israel. And this is the very first moment when uh, Actually, it's my family descending the airplane. And uh, this image looks like very typical Jewish ad agency advertisement for the Aliyah, for uh, like immigration to Israel, Jewish immigration to Israel. And uh, it's like me, my grandparents, my mom, and there is the last one is my grandmother. She didn't want to come, but uh, uh, her husband, my grand grandfather, he died just a couple of months before we were supposed to come. So we stayed a little bit more and like actually drugged her, drugged her by force <laughs> and uh, she was like not happy to be here and uh, she was looking from the window and the, and she, she she was seeing airplanes coming to the airport and she was like talking saying all the time new victims new victims and it really made me crazy because I was like a young girl I was like 14 and I was like uh, trying to be optimistic and my grandmother was just spoiling it so so this right. is why I named yes. This is why I named this uh, painting "New Victims." All right. So already we see your kind of uh, kind of subversive humor, where you know there's the ideal of what immigration to Israel is, and then you have this perspective of your a multi generational perspective of the problems as well, and her seeing it as uh, new victims. You also have details. Like, uh, I remember you said you came and you had to wear all your clothes because- Yeah, because we only were allowed to take like 40 kilos with us. So we tried to put as much as possible on ourselves. Right. So, and it was December in, you know, in Ukraine, December is pretty cold. So it was okay, you were in three pairs of pants. But when we came to Israel, it was a bit hot. And you can see the the kind of gap between the cultures when you see the local woman with her short sleeves and uh, the Russian, what we called, what was called Russian, you are Ukrainian. And again, there's a, there was a homog homog homogenization of all the people from the Soviet Union, which we today we know is not the case. So this is uh, briefly the the impetus for the immigration. Uh, would you like to tell us about this work? Yeah, actually, I built this series uh, um, in sort of like a before and after images. And here, uh, the um, like what we see here is this painting is called Putsch, and uh, it's about the Putsch of uh, 1991 when the um some members of communist party they tried to stop uh, gorbachev reforms so they sort of arrest him in his summer house and uh one day we just woke up and we've seen uh, the swan lake on tv on all the three uh, uh, national channels 
And in Soviet Union, if you see the Swan Lake in all the channels, it means something happened. But uh, but the government still doesn't know what to how to digest it to the to the citizens. So they put this Swan Lake uh, on all the channels just to uh, just to I don't know to make a pause. And uh, and uh, here is like a girl and her mother. They are like in shock because they because there is a, they understand that something happened. Right. I want you to notice a few details that relate to uh, I would say Zoya's unique style of painting and her own kind of visual vocabulary. So you'll notice this schoolgirl uniform, which will appear in a, a different series. Um, and you'll notice the the polka dots, which I think you really like, even uh, um, that it kind of uh, travels from painting to painting. Of course, the knockoff Gucci is uh, an indication of the socio-political situation where um, there is a look that, of course, Gorg Gorbachev was um, initiating towards the West. Yeah, uh, yeah. This uh, this Gucci is fake, of course, and uh, uh, it, I just uh, use this clothes to put these characters in exact point of times of time, nineteen ninety one, before because before on the before the nineties there was no these fake Gucci shirts in in Soviet Union, uh, because they started bringing them bringing them from China and from Poland and from everywhere, and uh, after the nineteen ninety one there was no school uniform. So somebody who who knows the background and looking at this picture, you understand exactly the time when it happened. Exactly. So historical, there's also something that you notice here, and that's a kind of satirical, almost uh, caricature uh, way of showing people. And we'll see that uh, in other works as well. We move from the Soviet Union to the immigration to Israel from Odessa to here it says Namal Ashdod, which is the port of Ashdod in Israel, uh, still unpacked. And we have three generations of immigrants um, and the language barriers are one of the topics here. Can you uh, elaborate on that, Zoya? Yes, of course. Well, this painting is called fucking Hebrew, and there is a family that is uh, like trying, th this is the Hebrew learning book, Ivrit Chaya. It was like the most popular uh, Ivrit, uh, Ivrit uh, learning book for, uh, for the immigrants from, from post-Soviet uh, countries. And uh, the parents and the boy, they are like learning, and the grandfather, there is no hope for him. So he's like lying back there. It's like sort of like he's like sort of half dead there. And he is reading a newspaper, which is called uh, Russian Israeli. And they uh, have bad news in it. Like soon all the all the uh, elderly people, their their uh, money will be cut. And um, and uh, as, as always, I use these details. Uh, um, like the, uh, it's it's very it's very important for me to get the precise details. Like this uh, underwear that uh, the man is uh, wearing is like very typical Soviet design for underwear. I think my grandfather he came with them, and I've seen it for twenty years hanging on the dryer there. So I can uh, can uh, repeat this pattern with my eyes eyes closed. I think. Right. And uh, the woman, she's like wearing this crazy t-shirt because at that time, uh, people from uh, Soviet Union, they, they didn't know, they didn't know English so good. So they, you, like, you could see sometimes people with funny, uh, funny texts on their, um, on their clothes. Like, for example, once I've seen like very cute grandfather on the street and he had like animal on his t-shirt. Right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, and of course, there's a lot of humor here, a lot of details. Um, she's writing, I, Ani Ola Hadasha Mi Rusia, I am a new immigrant from Russia. And it also relates to um, anthropological and sociological research on the immigrant experience where the kids are gonna be fine, the parents not so fine, the grandparents are not even gonna try. So you're hopeless. They, well, 
you said it, I don't want to say hopeless, mm -hmm. but, and you see the, the kind of, they, they didn't even unpack they're 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 still in transition and there is a yeah well this is uh uh this painting is called bamba because this is like a favorite israeli snack and this is what she found under the bed it's like a cleaning lady and i think like most of uh, new immigrants uh, went through this experience of being a cleaning person. And uh, also my mom, who is engineer, she was like cleaning houses for like uh, one year when we came. And uh, it's not possible to see it on this uh, image, but uh, she had like, she has like a real earring in her ear in shape of a music key. Uh, so, like, I guess she's sort of musician that is uh, working in uh, cleaning. And uh, there is also on the TV, there is a program, it's like satiric program in Israel, which is called Zeuze, it means that's it. But here it's like, uh, sounds uh, threatening, this, uh, this name. Right. So, you know, there was a lot of hoo-ha in Israel about the immigration. And this is, you know, this is where uh, the gathering of all the exiles, et cetera, very heroic, very positive image, uh, kind of vision. And Zoya's work really looks at the lived experience and all these uh, musicians, they say that the musicians who came from the former Soviet Union could make up like three or four full orchestras. Um, yeah. Of course, not everyone could find employment as doctors, as, as engineers, and many found these jobs just to make ends meet. Um, and uh, always the, the kind of typical uh, landscape that is, in in like almost orientalism here with the palms, but also the typical kind of housing in Israel that's uh, middle and low class housing. Uh, there was boiler, there's boilers on the roof. Right, you have the water heaters on the roof. And this is, um, and by the way, you see the, you see the polka dots in all of them. I'll let you guys look at them yourselves. But uh, Zoya, this has to do not just with the language barrier or the employment uh, gap, but with the religious uh, predicament. Yeah, well, actually, this um, this um, this uh, image is like um, talking about conversion because many people like myself, like we had to go through conversion uh, to be Jews and. Uh, we did uh, an attempt with my mother that didn't really work because uh, it's like not like you really have to change your life to the orthodox uh, lifestyle and it was not really not like we, di we didn't really want to do it so we tried and then just abandoned it but uh, uh, some families it's like important for them to to go till the end and uh, uh, there is at some stage there is uh, somebody from the religious community is coming to uh, inspect. To actually, huh? Inspect. It's, it's rather help than inspect because they like come to guide you how to make your kitchen uh, kosher. But uh, many people they were like angry about it because it's like you know it's like. Uh, uh, some people call it help, some people call it inspect, you know, like it's uh, still it's intervention in your private space, you know. So uh, this picture is like sort of funny because there is a family that they got ready and they have like Shabbat challah and uh, candles on the on the table and like, they're like prepared. But they are like not really professional Jews, so they cook this pork in the pots. And uh, probably it's like, uh, I, I, like I see it like as a frame from a sitcom or something, because uh, like uh, this, uh, this Orthodox uh, uh, man is opening this uh, pot and he see this uh, pork uh, nose. Maybe it's the, the first time in his life that he see it so close. And uh, there is also, uh, a box with uh, Mizra in uh, in the fridge, 
because uh, Misra is like the kibbutz that is producing most of non-kosher uh, foods in Israel. And they have this uh, red bottle with the drink crystal, which is uh, the Coca-Cola for, uh, for uh, Soviets, Orthodox and Arabs because it's cheap. Right. Yeah. So, so that is the people who want to try to fit into Jewish Israeli society and some yeah. of the people go in a different direction. Yeah, it's like some of them, they just suffer for a while and then they go, go back to their previous life. But, uh, but I think that me and my mom, we were just not motivated enough to pretend that we are into it. Uh, and this is uh, actually, this is also like a, all this, all these series, they deal with the cultural clash situation. So here it's uh, called Jaffa Dalet, which is actually a neighborhood where a lot of uh, Ar Ar Arabic, um, Arabic people used to live before they came of the big Aliyah from Soviet Union. But when, uh, when it happened, then also many so like post-Soviet uh, people, they came to live in this neighborhood. And uh, there was a rock club for, uh, for a Russian speaking youth. And I was going there because I was like a Russian speaking uh, young girl that liked rock music. And the one in the middle is my boy, used to be my boyfriend back then. Uh, so they just uh, sit outside of this club, drink and uh, play their Russian rock music. And there is two Arab women on the background that uh, uh, it's just a situation where like they look aliens to them and these guys, they look aliens to this woman. Right. So you have these groups with uh, this feeling of alienation, trying to to kind of create their own cultures, um, um, drinking punk, a lot of here. Uh, we see this kind of thing continue where you have the very, very um, challenging housing situation, one room for an entire family. And here you have the parents, here you have the, the son. Uh, do you wanna talk about this? Yeah, uh, this one is actually, is, uh, it belongs to the series uh, called the Soviet Childhood. And uh, it's based on my memories from the Perestroika times which was very exciting and uh, full of hopes. And everybody was like feeling that uh, soon we will be free and soon their life will be just uh, paradise. And uh, for the young people, it was especially uh, made us happy that uh, all, the, all the music and the pop culture from the West became uh, available. Uh, so sometimes all these posters from the rock bands or punk bands or like glam rock bands, they are, they are placed all together. You could see like Kiss and Modern talking together because it's from the West, you know, so it's like good enough to be on your wall. Right. And, uh, and uh, the parents, they are like uh, belong to the past, like they are like Soviet, typical Soviet parents. And the boy is, uh, is a rebellion. And... Uh, this, um, uh, it was like very typical to try to create, uh, trying to create a private space for a growing child in, in this one room apartment. So like people used to divide it with a closet and make, like there are like many young, uh, young people who grow behind the closet. Right, so this, this uh, brings us to this series, this uh, series uh soviet uh childhood and uh this uh young boy is attempting to find an identity that looks towards the west uh they used to call it the, little girl they used to call it the rotten breath of the west the rotten breath of the west okay yeah. Now, uh, this little girl has a different outfit that she's going to put on. Yeah, uh, this is the school outfit. And uh, I think this is like one of the strongest memories when you go in the morning, you go to school and it's still dark outside and then it's winter and, and cold. And you feel like it's like you feel like you have to wake up in the middle of the night and go somewhere. So I think this is like there is no, no much to tell about this uh, this painting because it's like purely emotional. 
Right. But uh, I think that most of us can remember that Monday feeling of going to school and not wanting to. Uh, here is something that happens in school. The yes, this is, yeah, this is the clock room. And it's also like uh, atmospheric because there is this uh, uh, school uniforms that everybody hated. And uh, this changing room, it's like... Uh, um, it's like also like this like sort of intimate moment when everybody's like getting undressed and also it's like um uh i don't know i think everybody's been through this situation so like i don't need to explain much i, I just try to transfer this feeling you know right so gym class or something like that um and uh is this you know you were 13 14 yeah, uh, for the first years of school, this would be uh, what you went through. Yeah, and also, you know, it's like a place when uh, uh, when you see like, you know, like in this, in, in, in uh, other situation, we are all dressed the same in this uniform. Mm. And uh, in the changing room, we can see who have uh, what underwear, you know. Right, a little bit of individuality. Yeah. This is one of my... <laughs> favorites uh you you talk through it the girls bathroom yeah well this one is a bit crazy because this is how the toilet in the school was uh without the door and uh, uh and also it was the place where, where uh, children used to hide smoke or do something forbidden you know so so and th there was no door so you could uh, uh, at the same time, like do your uh, do what you need to do and uh, still be part of a conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. and uh, I've been to this my school a year ago and still the same, but they have doors now. Okay, that's 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 good. That's good. <laughs> but you know, a lot of uh, um, your your paintings, you kind of sense this lack of private space the the public and the private yeah um, I, I think this was this was uh, one of the strongest experiences in soviet union like you don't really have private space there right and then no, i came with when i came with this to the school one year ago with one year ago with my daughter she like entered this toilet and she said like mom how do i use it she didn't, didn't understand right right and you know when you you had the experience with your husband and daughter in the immigration office, they were also probing into your marriage and your private space. So it's even it's, it's even worse than Soviet toilet. You know, I I, I would uh, agree to agree to use Soviet toilet in the end of my life and forget this experience with the Ministry of Interior. Right, right. Um, so this idea when you are um, subject to kind of these probing and peering yeah. uh, by the authorities, either by the school, by others, by society, or by the government. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are now, uh, we should have a drum roll. We are now moving to the new works. This is the new exhibition that opens April 7th in Fort Gansevoort uh, Gallery in New York City. And um, the title of the exhibition and the series is The Arrival of Foreign Professionals. And um, we are going to get a sneak peek and this is really, really exciting. So maybe you can begin by explaining this painting that is titled The Arrival of Foreign Professionals after Abram Cherkasky. It's from 2022. And I have the, the comparisons later, as you remember. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, this whole series, uh, there is one painting by my... Uh, grandfather's uncle who was a um, very well-known painter in uh, Soviet Ukraine and then in Soviet Kazakhstan. He was one of the like leading artists in the Kazakhstan Art Academy and uh, this is his painting from uh, 1932 
that I didn't really know about the existence of this word. And then somebody sent it to me on Facebook and he said like, look, this is your family. And I was like, uh, this situation looked like really weird to me because even now there is not so many Africans in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And uh, in 1932, I believe there was like really few. So I didn't really understand what happened here. And then I started digging a little bit and then I found out then that the Soviets, they, uh, that uh, uh, in the 30s, the Soviet Union was going uh, through like massive industrialization. They built like new factories, bought new equipment, and they, they needed professional workers do, that know how to work with this new equipment. So they went to the States that during the time of Great Depression, and they tried to tempt like professional workers to come to Soviet Union to teach the Soviets how to use all this machinery. And, uh, and uh, there were like few African Americans that they were like went to Soviet Union uh, to, to work and even one of them even wrote very beautiful memoir about it. And uh, and uh, I believe this is this is what is happening in this painting. There is like uh, African Americans came to to Ukraine or like Russia, I don't know. And uh, the Soviet family is welcoming them. And uh, on the on the back you can see the factory. So I believe I believe I I uh, I, I believe my guess was right because of the details of this painting. So I've decided. I've decided to do a remake of this painting of my great of my grandfather's uncle, like with my own language. Uh, but it's uh, quite uh, like quite the same same situation. So I find this astounding. You know, 1932 and 2022, um, different decades, different circumstances. And also the twists, you know, because people see this when you think of professionals and experts uh, and black and white uh, folks, th there's a there's like an assumption that uh, um, Europeans came to Africa as experts uh, to help the local population, whereas here it's absolutely the other way around. You have the African American engineers and professionals coming to help uh, the people in uh, Europe and Asia. So uh, something uh, pretty amazing, and these this kind of family situation, where um, it isn't animosity. It's it's just uh, the the a, a wonderful family situation uh, together. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, I forgot to say that this whole exhibition is uh, about, is like talking about experience of uh, post uh, of Africans in post colonial uh, in post colonial world. So it's also like some of the some of the paintings they are like uh, placed in Soviet Union. Some of them are placed in uh, somewhere else in Europe in Israel, like uh, Muslim places that are, like Muslim. They are based on on uh, situations that I've seen. Right. So we'll see a few of these, but this is extraordinary to think of uh, that your father's great great uncle, your grandfather's uncle, was a painter, and um, and and this homage to him and this continuation. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, this painting. Um, somebody wrote me like I, i've never seen it uh, in real life and then somebody wrote me that it's uh uh it's uh, on display in kiev uh like a, a little bit a little bit more than one year ago and i went to kiev just for one day to see it so i've seen it and uh it was my last visit to kiev actually because two months after the war started wow that must have been so emotional yeah i mean it, like it became even more meaningful since then Right. I'm sorry that I didn't even ask about uh, the situation there and how you may feel about it, but- uh, well, you better than ask you. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, one of my favorite paintings um, and I would love for you to share 
what it means well, this, with that. This is like a, based on real story by my husband. I asked him how did he come to Israel. He came to G to Egypt, and then there is like a um, sort of smugglers that bring uh, people through Egy Israel Egyptian border. Like it doesn't happen anymore because there is fence now, but before there was no fence, so people were doing it. And uh, like he said, like he really described me this, uh, the, the car, this Toyota Hilux. And uh, and uh, he said there was like people from Africa and from uh, post-Soviet countries. So I, I feel like somehow this, uh, there is always somehow um, a lot of common situation for, for uh, like, people from post-Soviet countries and for Africans, because uh, like they, in a, in a weird way, they sometimes share the same experience and same story. Yeah, so, so um, this is uh, for those of you who have been to the Sinai and to Southern Israel, beautiful, beautiful landscape and quite, quite empty. Um, so these were the smuggling routes and there's a lot of human trafficking. Some people for uh, are pol seeking political asylum, asylum or economic uh, opportunities in Israel, uh, leaving Africa. And uh, post-Soviet uh, women are often, often uh, actually trafficked to Israel, uh, either of their own free will or not. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. But this common point from, from the entry point is interesting, which brings us to this, um, Zoya, the dorms. Yeah, well, this is like a situation from the 80s. And uh, again, here the roles are different because uh, um, there was like, uh, Soviet Union was supporting uh, students from Africa and uh, Arab countries. So there was like, uh, in Moscow, there was even special uh, University of uh, People's Friendship, it was called, the Patrice Lumumba University, where uh, like African and uh, Arab students uh, were studying. But in every big uh, university or, or, uh, or college, there were like foreign, foreign students. And uh, for, for us, it was like very, like the, the for us, it was like the only possibility to, to meet somebody from abroad. So everybody was like really curious. And uh, also like, you know, they were like supposed to be simple people, but actually they were usually children of like rich people from Africa and from, uh, or like leaders of the communist party or or just rich people, you know? So so they were like quite rich compared to, to local girls. So it was like, uh, uh, it was like tempting in many ways to 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 meet them, and uh, actually this is based uh, also on evidence of my sister that she was married to she, she got married to a student from Jordan, and uh, this is how she met him at the party, and uh, she was like helping me to to make this picture this painting. She was like giving me giving me advice. Right, and we see sometimes that marginalized populations uh, gravitate towards each other or find common ground, uh, as, as Zoya said earlier. Yeah, but I think in Soviet Union, they were not marginalized. They are just like, you know, just regular girls. Right, right. Yeah. So in the Soviet Union, it, but it was yeah. an opportunity, not marginalized, but people who want to get away from the dominant mainstream so yes i think culture. it was also curiosity for the other because like uh, nobody could go abroad and nobody could see foreigners so much so it was like really we were like really curious to to talk to them even right right so not marginalized but uh, yeah. Uh, others yeah yeah and this is and back in israel right yes and uh uh, I think you can see that it's in Israel by the gold star beer on the table. And um, uh, actually this is the situation, like, I, like I, I came to this place and I didn't have to add anything. I just seen it as it is. And I, I said, okay, I have a ready painting. It's a place that used to belong to a friend of my husband and it's sort of illegal bar. And uh, 
uh, where like uh, the husband is Nigerian, the, the, the owner is Nigerian, and you can see him on the left side, and he was sitting like that and reading the Godfather book. And, uh, and uh, there is a TV on the wall that um, there was a National Geographic channel, and uh, there was like a mockumentary about uh, bear attacking tourists in some gorgeous national park. And, uh, and uh, it's like a place where only beer and few snacks like olives was served and uh, uh, all the Nigerian workers used to go there. And uh, there was also Israeli and many uh, like Russian and Ukrainians girls like looking for like one night stand. Like this was like a pretty sleazy place, but uh, like uh, when I've seen it, it just catch my eyes so much. Right. Um, definitely margins of society. Uh, mm -hmm. And she looks like a, an Asian uh, worker. I wonder if that's correct, because a lot of the uh, women from various Asian. Yeah, countries. yeah, yeah, she could be. And, uh, you know, I also try to build the relationship between the people in this image, because this girl that might be Asian, she's just uh, you don't know, like maybe she's trying hard to to hard to. She's just playing hard to get, or uh, or maybe she just doesn't like the guy, and he's like looking at her and uh, and like doesn't know how to approach her. Right. And uh, and the one on the left, she's just a bimbo. Okay. And speaking of of this kind of stereotyping that you do in your art, uh, which uh, some people find offensive, certainly not like easy to do but we were talking about that and you said that's part of your project uh, yes i mean I, i'm like talking about stereotypes and i have to have to bring them and make them clear and make them even grotesque to to show them better right right so i see we have about 10 minutes left i want to go through some of these quickly so that we have time for some of the questions um this broke my heart yeah this is uh, actually the friend of mine who came from nigeria and she was working as a caregiver in a, a elderly people house and uh, and uh, all these uh, people in this house there's like many of them are holocaust survivors and here is like again the meeting of two stories this working immigrant woman and the holocaust survivor with auschwitz number on her on her hand right and the cross uh so religion also starts uh well not starts continues to be also one of the kind of uh conflicts or issues yeah. that you yeah. uh mm -hmm. deal with and and we're moving to uh I, I just wanted to also say there's something about the codependence of different people that I find very moving. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there is a, a whole uh, like amazing series of paintings that are actually from Nigeria, right? No, this one is actually from Belgium. From Belgium, okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so usually talk about like, Belgium. Every, like every time I go to Europe, I try to find African market because I bring some foods for my husband that they don't sell in Israel. So on the same occasion, I drew sketches and there was a place in uh, in Brussels called Matonge and it's like the African neighborhood in, in Brussels. And uh, they have like um, this amazing hair, hair, hair and nails. There is always uh, a black man and woman that does hair and an Asian man that do, does nails. They're like wo wo work in a band. And uh, they have the, this huge uh, window glasses. So I was like sketching a lot in this neighborhood. That's amazing. So you see how new this series is that we didn't even have a chance to talk about it and to think that it's in uh, Belgium. Uh, it's very interesting that the mannequins uh, for the wigs are all white women and then all the customers are blacks and and yeah. there's an Asian man painting the nails it's it's just a stunning stunning work Thank you. um this one this one is uh, from Paris 
I saw the uh, Eiffel Tower that one I got. I, there is, uh, I put the Eiffel Tower to for people to see it's in Paris, but actually you can't see the Eiffel Tower from this place from this place. <laughs> um, uh, we went to it was also in the African market like that we went to find to look for some food with my husband. And uh, the experience was really similar to, to I, I said to my husband, look, we are like in the Nugu market in Nigeria. I'm the only white person here on the street. And uh, and uh, there was like this uh, uh, a lot of uh, for some reason there is a lot of uh, shops that sell cellular phones and, and all the accessories for cellular phones and this is just the scene I, I've seen there there was like a group of uh, African guys all dressed black and uh, and uh, another guy was uh, was passing by with roasted corn so I don't know somehow it just uh, it just uh, made a painting in my eyes. And this is a this is a, a based on um, it, it's an event, a Memorial Day of uh, my friend's father, and actually, like almost all all the all the female characters in this exhibition, they are based on my friend Lucy, that uh, I met her. Uh, in Nigeria before she came to Israel and then she came to Israel and we are like still friends and uh, this is the tradition of making like a mem memorial day uh, or a remembrance day uh, the daughter she performs a dance and all the women they throw money on her and uh, I was like at this party and uh, everybody was giving dollars for some reason I was the only one who brings shekel and uh, and her uh, son, who is like nine years old now, he was just uh, crawling in between the people and collecting this money because he was afraid that uh, it will get lost or something. It was like a funny and cute situation. Yeah, so different cultural rituals and things. Yeah, actually, they also they also do it in Nigeria, this event, but in, instead of money, they give uh, um, fabric, the, the, uh, like for a for wrapper. It's like six yards of fabric. And this is in Nigeria. It's like my older painting. I've been in Nigeria, I think, like four times. And uh, this was this was before my daughter was born. So here uh, you can see myself in the left corner. And my husband, he brought presents and he's uh, sharing them to his family. And actually, the last painting in this slideshow is is the same story. Yeah. So I just uh, when I saw you here. Um, and I thought, oh my God, once again, she is different, an outsider. So a Jew in Ukraine, an outsider, Ukrainian in Russia, in the Soviet Union, an outsider, a, an immigrant in Israel, an outsider, and then uh, the wife of a Nigerian man with his family in Nigeria, you're an outsider. Mm. But yeah. you, I think, you said it I differently. Think... You said how they responded to you. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm outsider, like maybe culturally or like ethnically, but uh, but uh, as an artist, I think I'm like just in the middle of consensus in Israel. Like I'm such a mainstream artist here, and uh, and um, I mean, I just I just feel comfortable being like foreigner because I've been foreigner like all my life, so I don't right. I, like, I don't feel like uh, something is wrong. So but in Africa, of course, it's different because I'm like the only the only white person in the, in the village. Like there are other other people married to people from Europe or people from whatever, but uh, they don't live there. It's just you know we just come to visit, and for children, of course, they just come to touch me if I leave a paint on their fingers or something. Right. So um, I just want to say that uh, when you said that uh, as an artist, it's like art is the only place where you belong. And you're not it's in my Africa. homeland. <laughs> it's your homeland. I was thinking that being both an insider and an outsider in that kind of liminal space, that's the best position for an artist. So you both know the culture, but you also see it from the outside. I think yeah. I'm going to go, um, Zoya, quickly through until the last one, because yeah, yeah. we have five minutes for okay. questions. Uh, this, uh, this painting is called The Widower. And the... Uh, we went to see a friend of my husband that lost his wife just one day ago and he was like sitting in his room with his eyes red 
and it was like such a strong like such a strong uh, moment right and you know we see all the christian imagery the tired tailor yeah they just really love jesus there you know yeah so the tired tailor it's like uh it's you know like in nigeria the families are huge they're like millions of people and they're all nuggets and um and like usually when you go shopping, you go to your family. So also the tailor, she's somehow related. And uh, we went to to her to her store, to her shop. And this uh, fabric with the purple horses, it was our uniform for my fa my husband's mother burial. Because right. everybody's making same like clothes, like different styles, but same fabric. And uh, we we came to her to fit this clothes, and she was uh, she didn't have work at that moment she, so she was sleeping on the table it was so cute very cute and we see some of the fabrics in the clothes later i want to get to this one and end and we have time for a few questions i looked in the chat most of them zoya are just uh thank you to you and thank you. actions with everything you said and laughing at your jokes and being interested in your art. But this is a work in progress. This is, as you see, it's in Zoya's studio still. Yeah, this is, I'm just working on it now. So I wanted to bring it. It's like same situation when my husband is sharing presents, but now it happens in our gorgeous villa in the village of Nugo. And, uh, and also this painting is based on uh, uh, a 19th century painting by a painter called Martino. Okay, so you take the classical, the traditional European paintings, and you make them, you transform them into your villa with Sunny giving out all the uh, gifts to the big, big Nadi family. And of course, we have the polka dots as well. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. I'm looking at the wonderful comments. Uh, okay, so the MFA, someone from the MFA here in Boston says that uh, they have uh, acquired your Aachen Agada and have uh -huh. it um they ask that i write the title of the books in the chat so i will write that and uh oh madeline already did it's the catalog is called pravda pravda means truth in russian and it's also the party newspaper it's like the uh, damn party newspaper right um the details for uh the the exhibition everyone all my team already put it in the chat um so ms Cherkovsky uses such an interesting color palette in each painting could she explain her process for selecting and using color it's very intuitive um uh, I, I like I like um, modern modernist painting when where everything is a little bit exaggerated. So I guess my palette is like more bright. Uh, but uh, I mean, I just do it very intuitively. Okay, lively and fascinating webinar. So happy to experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank work, you. Especially the shadow colors. Okay. Thank you, Zoya. Thanks. Thank you. Wonderful to learn more about you, Zoya. Thank you for showing Zoya's beautiful work. <laughs> wow. Just thank you for everyone. So we have one minute left. Oh, one more. I love your work. Thank you, Zoya. <laughs> <laughs> there are no questions. Um, there are only um, a lot of uh, praise. And I'm really happy to uh, thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, Zoya, not just thank for you joining us, goodness. not just for joining us and not just for your friendship, but also for your art. I thank think you very it much. brings a lot of understanding to to all of us. 
and I'll see you in New York uh, next week at the opening. There is a question, will this tape be available? So Jay Arts uh, are uh, the initiators of this uh, and all the collaborators have, we have recorded this and it's still recording and it will be available through the Rose website, through our YouTube channel and everyone else. Um, so um, I think that we will be ending this uh, webinar and just thank you so very, very much, everyone. Thank you very much. It was, okay. it was a pleasure talking to you.